This Congress is meeting in the midst of truly dramatic events. As I stand here, a bloody civil war is unfolding in Ukraine. And we have the even more bloody spectacle of the brutal attack of Israeli imperialism against the people of Gaza. These two events alone are sufficient to indicate the explosive nature of the period in which we live. And as you see from this marvelous banner behind me, this is also the anniversary of a very important event. 150 years ago, Marx and Engels founded what became known as the First International, the International Working Man's Association. which was, if you like, an anticipation of what is absolutely necessary and was recognized by Marx and Engels even from the first period, even from the Communist Manifesto, as an absolute necessity for the preservation of humanity. and for a transition to a new and higher form of human civilization. That necessity, that imperative necessity, is the international organization of the proletariat. And that's what this Congress is about, comrades. We are the proud continuers of this great tradition that says that socialism is international or it is nothing. But as you also know, 2014 is another anniversary. Almost exactly 100 years ago, you had what I prefer to call the great slaughter. Don't like the expression. They used to call it the great war. I think that is a, an incorrect, incorrect formulation. One can speak of a great writer or a great artist or a great composer or even a great football match. Dare I mention the result of the football match in Brazil? <laughs> what was it? 7 1, was it? Mind you, the English didn't do any better, they did worse. So don't laugh, English comrades. And the Spaniards weren't too clever either. But let's leave football alone because I don't wish to sow, sow dissension in the hall. Anyway, I'm opposed to football on principle, as you know. And the Brazilian comrades are in the Leninist tradition of revolutionary defeatism, so they didn't mind. But to return to serious matters, what these uh, uh, tragic events in, in, uh, in the Ukraine and uh, in Gaza illustrate, and it's the main feature of the present world, so you think of it, it's the main feature, everywhere, everywhere, at all levels, financial, economic, social, political, 
diplomatic, military, all these levels, you see the same colossal instability. It brings to mind Hegel's marvelous phrase, which Marx used, of course. All that is solid becomes dissolved. All that appeared to be stable becomes unstable. And in Hegel's expression, reason becomes unreason. Most people, ordinary people, when they read the newspaper or they turn the television on, have the conclusion that the world has gone mad. Things were not like this. Everything's changed. And in a primitive way, without understanding, but they feel it in, in, in the marrow of their bones, that something has changed, something has snapped. And that the old order is, is dissolved. It's gone. It's finished. The old world of, of security, of stability, in which uh, today was like yesterday and tomorrow will be like today. And that gave people a sense of security, by the way. People felt secure, at least in the advanced capitalist countries. It wasn't so in the countries of uh, what they call the third world. I don't like that expression, but I can't think of anything better. It wasn't, wasn't true for Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East. It wasn't true. Even in the best period of capitalism, the, the long period of upswing, not a boom. There have been booms and slumps all the time. No, no, no. A long period of upswing. And it, an explosive development of the productive forces, which after the Second World War, for peculiar reasons, for peculiar reasons, for a peculiar concatenation of circumstances, which in all probability will never be repeated, it emerged out of the war, as a matter of fact. But there, were, there was a period of explosive development of the productive forces in the advanced capitalist countries. And that determined the consciousness of millions of people. That explains the stability, relative stability of the relationship between the classes. And the relative stability of the old organizations, let's be clear, that's, that's changing now. It's changing. But it was rooted, it was rooted in the development of the productive forces. Well, that's finished. It's finished. People can see that it's finished. You know, Ted Grant, before he died, some years before he died, actually, predicted that we were entering into the most turbulent period in history, the most disturbed period in history. Some, some comrades doubted that. I, I remember there was a Swedish comrade, a female comrade. She's an ex-comrade now. But she was very clever. I noticed that all the ex comrades were very clever people. You know, very clever people. <laughs> I suppose that's why they're all ex comrades. They're far too clever for the IMT. And she stood up and she said, Ah, what, what do you mean the most turbulent period in history? What about the fall of the Roman Empire? 
Well, I, I must confess, I must confess, in all honesty, that uh, the fall of the Roman Empire, what was indeed a somewhat turbulent period. Yes, but if you look at it, the world at that time, the world of the Roman Empire, was a very narrow world. It was just Europe and a narrow fringe around the Mediterranean, that's all. That was the world. Now, for the first time in history, and it's a brilliant confirmation of the most modern of all perspectives documents, the Communist Manifesto of Marx and Engels, who, who predicted globalization, by the way, they predicted it. 150 years ago, read the manifesto. But globalization now is manifested as a global crisis of capitalism, which draws in all countries without any exception. It's a crisis everywhere, everywhere you look. In some countries, the crisis is proceeding more rapidly. With, uh, with a greater intensity. In others, it's unfolding more slowly, with lesser intensity. But the crisis exists everywhere, without exception. Now, Lenin pointed out that politics is concentrated economics. Well, that's very true. In the last analysis, everything is determined by uh, the development of the productive forces, yes. We, we know that the bourgeois critics of Marx in the universities, and it's pre precisely in the universities you find the most ignorant people in society, and I'm not referring to the students necessarily, they say, oh, Marx reduced everything to economics. You heard that argument? Absolute nonsense. How can you reduce everything to economics? It's stupidity. What Marx and Engels did say, and it's absolutely true, is this. That in the last analysis, in the last analysis, the viability of any socio-economic system is determined by its ability to develop the productive forces. Yes, yes, and a thousand times yes, and who can deny it? Only a complete idiot, a university idiot can can dare to deny that. And therefore, now I won't spend too much time discussing the economics, because we've done this quite exhaustively over the last few years. There's not a lot to add to what we've written in the past, except to say that all the uh, facts and figures that they've uh, published indicates that our analysis is absolutely correct. <coughs> the decisive turning point, of course, was 2008. And uh, with the collapse of, of, of the financial system, which led to a, a collapse of the productive forces. And ever since then, how long ago is that? That's six years ago. But for the last five years, they've been talking about a recovery. They used to call it the green shoots, but they don't refer to agriculture anymore. 
Oh, we, 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 the recovery is beginning, the recovery is beginning. And they search for any small little indication anywhere to prove that there's a recovery. And by the way, if there was a recovery, for example, in the United States, we'd be the first ones to admit it. From our point of view, that's not a disaster. On the contrary, if there was a genuine recovery of industry, for example, that would immediately lead to an enormous wave of strikes in the private sector, which is so far lagged behind. <laughs> Everywhere wages have been held down. And there are not many strikes in the private sector. Most of them have been in the public sector. Strikes and big strikes and demonstrations. And that itself is an important development. You look at the kind of people that are on strike and are demonstrating in different countries. Who are they? Civil servants? Funcionarios públicos, teachers, doctors, nurses, you know, uh, these, were, uh, these were layers that in the past would never strike. And they were actually, the, before the war, they were the social reserves of reaction. Of fascism, as a matter of fact. Like the students before the war before the Second World War, were, were reserves of reaction. Re recruiting grounds for fascism and strike-breaking. Can you not see the change? Yes. A fundamental change. That the social reserves of reaction have been reduced to a minimum expression now. And that's an important point, because it means that the bourgeoisie, for example, in Europe, for example, in Greece, or in Spain, before the war, there's a crisis like this, and strikes and demonstrations, or in Italy uh, in 1920, the bourgeoisie would immediately move towards fascism. But they cannot do that now, despite the ignorant sects, the ignorant ultra-left sects, who always make every mistake that's imaginable and a few that are not imaginable. And they're always beating the tom-toms. Fascism, fascism, fascism. They don't even understand the ABCs. The bourgeoisie cannot move towards fascism in Greece, for example. Because the correlation of class forces is decisively against that. That's why the Golden Dawn, which is a fascist, that is a fascist movement. Le Pen in France is, is not a fascist, he's a reactionary chauvinist demagogue, yes, anti-immigration, that's true, yes. But she's, she's moved away from fascism, her father was a fascist, she's moved away from fascism. But she, she wants votes, she wants a moderate image. But uh, the Golden Dawn in, in Greece is certainly a fascist organization. I think they were a little bit mad, actually. A little bit like the in it. They wanted to take power. They had the illusion they were going to take power. I'm sure of it. They, were. they started provocations, you know. They killed a, a, a famous left-wing singer, I think he was. And immediately there was mass demonstrations all over Greece. That was a warning to the bourgeoisie 
if they tried to move in the direction of fascism now under these circumstances, they'd be faced not with a one-day general strike, they'd be faced with insurrection. Because the Greek people have got long memories, they remember the junta. And they remember the Second World War and fascism. And therefore the Greek bourgeoisie has had to put uh, these, one or two of these leaders in prison. They had to take action against the Golden Dawn. Not destroy it, of course, not destroy it. The master of the house needs dogs, ferocious dogs to protect his property. But the, ma but the master of the house needs to keep these dogs on a firm lease under, under his control. Now this is an important point of perspectives. And it's, it, there, are, there are differences, you see. It's true, there are many points of similarity with the 1930s, that's perfectly true. And one can draw analogies. But you must be careful with in, in analogies. Analogies have got limits. There are also big differences, colossal differences with the 1930s. Particularly in Spain and in Greece, it's obvious, huge differences. And therefore, the process is prolonged. It'll be prolonged over a long period. Which, from our point of view, is, is a good thing. To go back to what I was saying about the economy. If there was a genuine boom, because wages have been held down for a long time, Well, prices have been rising. Inequality is rising. And beneath, beneath the surface of apparent calm, everywhere, there's a seething discontent. Everywhere. The workers can see that they're being robbed. They're being fleeced. They're very angry about it. But they're afraid to strike because of mass unemployment. Or if we strike, then uh, the, the boss will close the fact that he moved to China. He won't move to China, as a matter of fact, but that's a threat they use. <laughs> and therefore, the moment that the workers will see that there's a full order book, that unemployment is going down somewhat, there'll be a mass of economic strikes. You'd be sure of it. So we, we, it's not that we're afraid of an economic recovery. We're not. But there is no recovery. Read my lips. There is no recovery. Okay? Now, you know, you know that the, 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 the intelligent bourgeois usually come to the same conclusions as the Marxists, but with a delay. And recently, the OECD published a document, Perspectives for the Next, for the World, Perspectives for the Next 50 Years. There must be very clever people in the OECD. Good God, they can't even predict the weather for, for, three, for more than three days. But they're going to predict the developments for the next 50 years. I, w I wish they'd tell me how, they, how to do that. So this is not a, a serious scientific analysis. But nevertheless, it, the, the, the results, the conclusions are, are significant. What are the perspectives for the strategies of capital for the next 50 years?
no growth for the next half century. No growth. No significant growth, anyway. Now, that is a very interesting conclusion. Other strategists in, in, the, in the economists of the Financial Times have stated, and that is a bit, a bit more scientific, it's based on facts. It is impossible, the, the, the Euro crisis cannot be solved for less than 20 years. What does that mean, concretely? You see, again, when I, when I, I travel all around to many sections, I meet such clever people. You know. I meet such clever people. Their cleverness astonishes me. One can even conclude that they read a little bit of Lenin, which, is, which of course, is a very good thing. You know. But as we say in English, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. There's one of, the, one, of the, one of them in Italy. Says, ah, he says, but didn't Lenin say that there's no such thing as a final crisis of capitalism? I answer, yes, Lenin said precisely that. And didn't Lenin say that the capitalist system can recover from even the deepest slump? Yes, that's absolutely true. As a general statement, it is absolutely undeniable. But, as it, but it tells me precisely nothing about the concrete situation now. It tells me nothing. about the concrete situation at the present time. The, uh, the, 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 question, the two questions that you have to ask is how long will it take the bourgeois to get out of this present crisis, which is the biggest crisis in history, and at what cost? Who pays? That's the decisive question now. Who pays? And the fact of the matter is, it will take them at least 20 years to get out of the, the, the Euro crisis if they succeed, which is not clear. If they succeed. And what that means concretely is 20 years of austerity. More of the same medicine. Cuts after cuts after cuts. 20 years of falling living standards. The comrades in Spain were telling me last night, I think it was Anna actually that was reading a, a text sent by her sister in Madrid, who's a nurse. And the, 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 the medical system in Spain improved a, a lot over the last 20 or 30 years. Astonishing improvement. When I was living in Spain in the 1970s, that was in, in, in the Franco period, I said to Anna, if ever, I, if ever I fall seriously ill and I'm unconscious and I can't speak, don't take me to any Spanish doctor or any Spanish hospital. Put me on the first plane to London. Yes, but now it's different. The Spanish health system in the last 20 years was better than the English system. Much better. And now it's being destroyed. I think Anna perhaps should give the information. It's astonishing. It's being cut to the bone in the most incredible way. And, and that's only the beginning. In other words, what do we say? What do we say? Everywhere, in Sweden, in Denmark, the same, in Germany, in Austria, and certainly in the countries of South Europe. The workers had conquered for the last 50 years. They conquered. What did they conquer? 
the conditions of a semi-civilized existence. That's all, a semi-civilized existence. And now, the bourgeoisie cannot afford to continue with that, even, even with those conquests, the, incompatible with capitalism. What has been resolved in the last five years? Nothing's been resolved. The huge debts which were paid to the bankers, that was the sole purpose, to prop up the banks, must be paid by the poor, by the working class. Have those debts gone away? Are they reduced? They're not. They're still there. It's a drag on the system. Un peso muerto, no? And therefore, the, 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 that's the perspective. And if anyone thinks that the workers are going to sit with their arms folded, while all their conquests are destroyed, then that's a very sad, a very poor illusion. So what Ted said was correct. And by the way, I'm not speaking in the future tense. As Ted said, we will enter this period. Comrades, we have already entered into this period. That's the period we're living in. And that is going to continue for the foreseeable future. And it is a finished recipe for class struggle everywhere. What are, the, what are the fundamental characteristics of this period? It is perfectly clear. A period of wars, and you have wars already. Not world war. That's ruled out by the correlation of forces on, on a global scale. See, now there's an anniversary of 1914. These superficial idiots, oh, I beg your pardon, these very clever ladies and gentlemen from the universities who know how to, some of them know how to read, you know, it's a story, some of them, some of them know how to read. Oh, look, the Ukraine, it's the same as the, the Balkans in 1914. Oh yes, that's, that's true, it's true. There are definite parallels, definite parallels between what's happening in the Ukraine, which is a proxy war actually between Russia and America basically. And the national questions involved and other questions. But we'll discuss the Ukraine, but we have to find means of discussing the Ukraine later on this week. Maybe we'll have to organize a commission. But uh, in any case, there are parallels, yes. Are there parallels? Yes. Will it lead to a war between Russia and the United States in America? No. It will not. It cannot. Because of the correlation of class forces. But we'll deal with that in a moment. And we'll deal with that in a moment. The recovery, insofar as you can talk about it, the recovery, the, the bourgeois economists admit this. It's the weakest recovery in the whole of history. Did they say this? The economist said about uh, two weeks ago, and I quote, they said, well, there's no real recovery. This is an, an editorial. And the last 12 months have been particularly feeble. The uh, figures in America. Because America is the key to the world, the world economy. There cannot be a genuine recovery unless there's a recovery in the States. In the first quarter, 
there was a negative growth of 2.9% of the American GDP. A negative. It, it fell. Yes, that's correct, isn't it? John confirms that it's correct. The, the, actually, the main uh, motor force of, of what recovery there was in the States. By the way, the, the figures given by the, the Brazilian comrades, I think they've withdrawn the amendment. But the figures are out of date, actually. It refers to the, it, it, the, 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 figures from two, the figures from 2012. But, in, but the, the, initially, there was a bit of a, an upturn in construction. As a matter of fact, they were beginning to develop a bubble, in, like a speculative bubble in construction, like before. But that's finished now. There's a, a, a slowdown in real estate, in rentals, in construction, in retail. And apart from the froth on the stock exchange, which is a, of a speculative nature, there's no real recovery. I won't deal much with, with, with the so-called third world. I don't like that expression. But Rob just informed I haven't been able to read the papers the last few days. But Rob just informed me, fill my glasses, a good chance, that Argentina is about to default. They can't pay the interest on the debt. So this Wednesday, the, I think it's the second biggest economy in Latin America, is going to go down. And that must have a big, big effect on the whole of Latin America. At a time when Brazil, which is the main motor force, the main, that's the most powerful country. Is, it's it was growing very fast. It's finished. Because menos de un percento, or no sense. El crecimiento de Brasil. Sergio, estás despierto? Sí. Bienvenido. Es menos de un uno. No. <clears throat> it's growing by a miserable one percent, which is a catastrophe for Brazil. If you look at, the, at, at Europe, the situation is even worse. Europe is stagnant, with the exception of Germany, and even there the outlook is, 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 is negative, according to the official figures. There are 26 million unemployed people in the Eurozone alone. And by the way, let's be clear. You see, the, the, the perspectives of the bourgeoisie, 2014 was supposed to be the period, where, the year of expansion. That's what they said last year. It's not. If you take uh, Europe, by the way, the French economy is, is, is in a mess. It's the second biggest uh, economy in Europe. And it's stagnant and it's going, it's going down. The Italian economy, which is the third economy, is in an even worse position. And this, of course, must have fundamental effects. Don't, don't, don't be fooled by the optimistic propaganda. Don't be fooled by that. A, 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 a more accurate way of measuring the real position is follow the stock exchange. You know, follow your investments, see how they're doing. 
And what you see on the stock exchange is an enormous nervousness. And that was revealed just about a week ago, a little bit more than a week ago. The biggest bank in Portugal is the Banco Espírito Santo. It's a, it's a good name for a bank. For those of you, particularly among the British comrades, who are not very clever at languages, it means the Bank of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and it, and it, ju it just almost gave up the ghost. There was just a rumor that this bank was in crisis, a rumor. And there was a collapse on the, on the, on the Portuguese stock exchange. And immediate repercussions in all the other European stock exchanges. And if you think, well, that's just anecdotal, well, it may be anecdotal, but anecdotes can very often tell us quite a lot about the real position. Angela Merkel, who's the real boss of Europe, warned that that, that incident underlined the weakness of the European banking system as a whole. And it, it showed how quickly the markets can lose their nerve <coughs> and provoke a new crisis. That's not me speaking, that's Angela Merkel. The GDP growth in the Eurozone in the last, on an annual base, annualized basis is less than 1%. Where's the growth? Where's the recovery? There is no recovery. I repeat. Uh, unemployment, I've forgiven the figures. But in Germany, it's 5.1%, officially, 5.1%. In Italy, officially, it's 12.6%, which is a joke. I think all the Italian statistics are a joke. Not to speak of Italian politicians. Although our comrades, of course, are very serious people. Spain is officially 25.1%. That's the figures I've got, anyway. And I don't know what the figures for Greece must be what, 26%, something like that? Officially. How much? More, of course, it's more. How much? Possibly. Pardon? Can't hear you. 27. 27, that's more like it. 27, that's official. But if you deal with youth unemployment, which is a very explosive question everywhere, then the situation is a little short, it's not, not less than catastrophic. Here in Greece, of every, out of every three young people, under 25, two are unemployed. And this is an explosive question everywhere. Youth unemployment was at the basis of the revolution in Tunisia. At the basis of the revolution in Egypt. And it is an explosive issue every In Spain, for example. We'll deal with Spain later. Because let's be clear on this, comrades. For us, economics is not an, it's not a, 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 an interesting academic question. It's just the tactics of the technical... Not that. We only discuss economics for the light it can cast on the development of class consciousness and the movement of the working class. By the way, Brit Britain is, uh, you can say Britain is lagging behind the rest of Europe, or South Europe certainly. But it will catch up. 
There was a big strike in the public sector a couple of weeks ago, 10 days ago. In the autumn, it's possible there may be a general strike in, in, in the public sector at least. But leave that to one side. Don't forget, when was the, the riots in Britain? Two years ago? Three years? In 2011. There was an explosion of the uh, unemployed youth in, in Britain. You know, these nice, quiet, respectable Brits. Like our friends on the British delegation, nice, quiet, respectable people. <laughs> Except for Darrell Cousins. <laughs> yes, but the real face of the youth of Britain, you saw that in, in these riots. Of course, we don't advocate riots. But that's an interesting, but that comes to the heart of the question, as I'll show. It comes to the heart of the question. If the trade union and labor leaders in Britain were worth anything at all, and they are not, they would have organized the unorganized youth, made an effort to organize them. Give them a cause to fight for. But these dispossessed youth, they're left on, but most of them black, Asian, and so on. Not all of them, white people as well. In all countries, they're being left to rot. And therefore, of course, they express their, their, their anger in, 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 in an unconscious way. But it was, it was like an insurrection. Unfortunately, with the characteristics of a riot, burning buildings, burning cars. Attacking the police. But, and the police fled. They fled. They fled, ter terrified. Of course, that, uh, because there was no organization, no leadership, it led nowhere, of course. And most of these kids went to jail, of course. Ferocious repression was exercised. But that incident uh, was, was a warning of what is building up in all countries without exception. Uh, what is the problem then? What is the problem? By the way, I didn't mention China. About uh, I'll finish with the world economy. China was supposed to be the motor force. China, China cannot, cannot provide the, the, the same uh, role as, as the United States of America. It's absurd. We, we have a slight dif difference with the Brazilian questions, on, on, with the Brazilian comments on China. We don't accept that it's a poor, dominated, third world country. On the contrary, it's, a, it's, it's developing quite fast a, a, on a capitalist basis. But, but we would agree with the comrades. We, of course, we agree. It's not on the, nothing like the United States. The idea that they can overtake America is nonsense. They said the same thing about Japan in the past, by the way. And the Chinese economy now is slowing down. That's, of course. Of course. It, it is a very simple question. If America is not consuming, China cannot export. And if Europe is not consuming, China cannot export. If China cannot export, Argentina, Australia, and other countries will find that their exports to China also will go down. So it's a, it is a global crisis in which all sections are included. <coughs> but uh, I, I think we, we must spend some time before I deal with the main question, 
which is, to use a, an expression of Trotsky, through what stage are we passing in relation to the uh, mass movement, the movement of the working class? But that we must spend some time in this Congress on the question of world relations. where there's been important changes have taken place. For example, in relation to the Ukraine. What does this mean? Well, again, Ukraine shows the enormous instability which, which I've uh, mentioned. Uh, the, the growth of the, the development of capitalism in the Ukraine for the last 20 years has reduced what ought to be a prosperous European country to a position of absolute beggary, absolute misery. It's been looted by the bankers and capitalists, by the oligarchs, as, as they're called. <coughs> that's at the, that's the, the basis of the problem. So there's a desperate mood in the Ukraine. Some people, particularly in the west of Ukraine, thought they could find a solution in the, in the European Union. Well, now they're finding what it means to be loved by Frau Merkel. <laughs> they're being crushed in her embraces. They, they give some money to the Ukraine. Not much. The Russians were offering more, as a matter of fact. But of course, on condition, as always, you must carry out cuts, austerity. You must raise prices. We've raised prices brutally. You must cut. You must close uneconomic factories. Ukrainian industry has been destroyed. And of course, into this equation steps United States imperialism. U.S. imperialism is a monster. It is the most counter-revolutionary force on the planet. And everywhere it puts its dirty hands, it causes chaos, wars, misery, death, destruction. Ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the U.S. imperialism has been constantly trying to take control of the ex-Soviet republics. Taking advantage of Russia's weakness at that time. But that situation changed during the, uh, the Georgian War. In effect, the clique, the clique in the Kremlin, Putin and his clique, said to the Americans, after the humiliation in the Balkans, humiliation in Iraq, they said to the Americans, so far and no further. You know, the Americans were going to put missiles in, uh, in Poland. And when the Russians protested, they said, oh, no, no, it's not against you. No, no, it, it's for Iran. So, you know, so, so in order to attack Iran with missiles, they set missiles in Poland. It doesn't quite, doesn't quite make sense. And the Russians, the Russians didn't see the joke. Putin hasn't got a good sense of humor. You know. And now we have again, the Ukraine. There's no doubt whatsoever that the American imperialists, the CIA, initially with the, with the support of the Germans, of Merkel, 
Although, when she saw the, uh, what was happening, she's drawn back. She's terrified. They wanted to have a, li a little regime change in Kiev. It, it may be true, it may be true. I don't know. In the, in the first instance, that the Maiden, Euro Maidan movement was a mixed movement, there were some progressive elements. Certainly, all Ukrainians hate the oligarchs, that's true. They hate the oligarchs, that's true. But even if that were true, and I'm not sure that it is true, it was quickly taken over by the most reactionary pe people you could imagine. Nazis, fascists, extreme Ukrainian nationalists, and Ukrainian nationalism has got a very, very nasty history, going back a long time, very nasty, anti-Semitic, completely reactionary. The followers of Bandura were carrying their, their, ba their, band their flags on the demonstration. These bastards supported the, to use the phrase, the phrase of Yatsenyuk. I never heard a diplomat say using the word bastards before. You know. He said, ah, oh, we must cast these bastards that, 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 that down this a aeroplane. Yes. Personally, I'm not very sure who these bastards were. It wasn't the Russians, that's for sure. We try to blame the Russians. It wasn't the Russians. And I'm not convinced it was the rebels. I think it is entirely possible that the men in Kiev decided to down this plane. That's entirely possible. You know. I mean, uh, Anna's very fond of uh, detective stories, you know. Uh, you know, Agatha Christie, Poirot, all, all that stuff. Which therefore I am obliged to watch. <laughs> and I notice that whenever there's a murder, the first question is, who gains? You, you must establish a motive. What motive is there? What motive did the Russian have for shooting down this plane? None. What motives did the rebels have? None. Might have been a mistake, it's possible, maybe. But it's not proven, there's not a shred of evidence. And don't tell me, don't tell me that the CIA lacks technical means, lacks satellites, lacks radar systems, or maybe, maybe they were not paying any attention to the Ukraine. They were looking the other way. Maybe they were looking at New Zealand, Alan. You know, I don't know. Yeah, they're not paying any attention to the Ukraine. No, they have the information. They must know everything that happened. Every missile that was, 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 was sent. And yet, the CIA publishes a report. And the only evidence in this report is dubious pictures and recordings from social media. And what's, what's the source of these reports? From the Kiev government. The only ones that had an interest in this. I don't know. That, that I can't prove that. I can't prove it. But at the very least, it is a distinct possibility. The uh, media coverage of the Ukraine in the West is absolutely disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. I've, I've seen many uh, propaganda campaigns. But I've never seen such a lying, disgusting, scandalous campaign of filth as what they do in the rest of the Ukraine. 
It's a, it's a uh, democracy. Democracy. You got fascists involved. Banderisti, Bandura. Yeah, Bandura. Bandera, rather, not Bandura, Bandera. Who organized the SS, uh, an SS battalion. And fought with Hitler Germany in the Second World War. Where millions of Ukrainians, of course, fought with the Red Army against Hitler. A completely reactionary movement. Not an atom of progressive content. And what you have in the Ukraine now is not democracy. <laughs> what you have in the Ukraine now is a white terror. Systematic repression directed against the left wing, against communists. Beaten, arrested, imprisoned against the trade unionists. You had the, the uh, pogrom in, uh, in Odessa. How many people were killed? 42, wasn't it? 42 people burned alive when the fascists burnt down the trade union headquarters. And many of those that jumped, up, jumped from the flames to escape were beaten and stabbed to death on the street. Nobody's been punished. No serious investigation. And Yulia Timoshenko, who's the one of the backers of this regime, congratulated the, the, the fascist murderers and what they'd done in Odessa. Where is this reported in the Western press? No, no. Putin, 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 Russia, Russia, separatists. The first thing these gangsters did when they came to power, they tried to pass a, 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 a bill prohibiting the Russian language, where the majority of the people in the East and the South speak Russian. They speak Russian and Ukrainian in the middle. It's, it's, it's an open provocation to the people of the East who felt threatened and began to take action. It is a movement in, 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 in Donetsk, in Luhansk, in other places. And by the way, initially, because the Ukrainian people don't want to fight each other. They don't want. Most Ukrainians don't want this. They can't believe it's happening. And when the, the, the Kiev government sent the army, the troops uh, mutinied. They jumped off the tanks, abandoned their vehicles, refused to fight. Then this gang in Kiev organized the so-called National Guard, consisting mainly of fascists, Nazis, and all kinds of criminal elements, who pre were prepared to act against the people of the East. And therefore, you have a bloody civil war. Oh, in the meantime, of course, Putin t took Crimea. And there's a big uh, protest in the West about this monstrous annexation. There's a lot of hypocrisy in this. What's our attitude towards Crimea? Well, we have to discuss it. It's a, it's a complicated question. The Ukraine is very complicated. It's not... And it's wrong to simplify complicated questions. But I would say, if you take the Crimea in isolation, which of course you cannot do, more than 70% of the people considered themselves Russian and were in favor of joining Russia. They were, more, most of the people in the Crimea were regarded as a liberation.
which of course it is not. It is not. Uh, Putin is a gangster, literally a gangster, literally a gangster, literally a gangster. An oligarch, with a huge fortune somewhere abroad. He's a Russian nationalist, so it must be abroad, of course. He's got every faith in Russia, so he sends his money abroad. And he represents the, a section of the Russian oligarchy. He's not interested in the poor people of the Ukraine. And he's shown that in his attitude towards Donetsk and the people of the East. He had 40,000 troops on the frontier. He didn't invade. He sent some weapons. I think he wants to keep this going, but he doesn't want them to win. In order to weaken the Kiev government, make them subordinate to Russia. In other words, it's cynical power politics. Not an atom of progressive content. But uh, the, it's a fact, the, the, the uh, Crimea, there was no fighting, very little fighting. He just put it in his pocket like that, just put it in his pocket. And that was very popular in Russia, by the way, very popular in Russia. Temporarily, he's benefited from that. But the poor devils in the east, the poor devils in uh, Donetsk, you leave them alone. He doesn't care how many people are killed. It suits him. If they're killed, he use, makes propaganda. Look, they're killing people. In... So it's cynical power politics on both sides. The question is, what's our attitude? What's our attitude? For example, in relation to Crimea. I said, in isolation, you could say, well, okay, the majority are in favor. They should join Russia. But the question we have to pose is this. As, as a general proposition. That is progressive which serves to raise the class consciousness of the proletariat. That is reactionary which serves to lower the class consciousness of the proletariat. What effect did the, uh, the, the annexation of Crimea have? In the Ukraine. It had a disastrous effect. As Alexei pointed out to me the other day, for 20 years, the, the Ukrainian ruling class has been trying to divide the Ukrainian workers along national lines, Russian, Russian speakers against Ukrainian speakers. 20 years. And they failed. They didn't succeed. There's a profound sense of unity of the workers of the Ukraine. That still exists, but it was severely weakened by the business of Crimea. The Ukrainian workers were shocked. And uh, Alexei was saying, he'd be going to the Ukraine after this. I mean, we have some contacts. And, and in the Crimea, we have contacts. But you can't discuss with the Ukrainian worker now. Unless you take a position on the Crimea. And therefore we have to say it's a reactionary development. Which has lowered, made the work of the revolutionaries in the Ukraine in particular and in Russia far more difficult. And by the way, there are reactionary elements on both sides. In, in Donetsk, unfortunately, in Donetsk, there are Cossacks, monarchists, fascists. The National Bolshevik Party is active there. You know what the National Bolshevik Party is? No? Never heard of them? I've seen them on demonstrations in, in Russia on the 1st of May and the 7th of November. They turn up, very organized, a lot of young people. 
They've got a big red flag with a white circle in the middle and a black hammer and sickle. Okay? From a distance, it looks exactly like the Nazi swastika flag. Now I'll surprise you. In the uh, statutes of this organization, it says that we are based on the following ideology. We stand for the ideas of Lenin, Trotsky, Hitler, and Mussolini. You know, if you can understand that, you're, you're cleverer than I am. But it's a fascist organization. So these, these extre the extreme Ukrainian nationalism produces extreme Russian nationalism. What's, what's the task of the Marxists in Russia and in the Ukraine? What's our task? We stand on the program of class unity. We should say to the people of the Ukraine, we are in favor of an independent, united, socialist Ukraine. You can't have that on a capitalist basis. The oligarchs are responsible for this. The Ukrainian nationalists are responsible for this. What, what nationalism is it that immediately threatens the unity of the Ukraine? Disgusting. But our first duty, as an international, is to combat the white terror in Ukraine. What, what is our duty? I asked the question earlier. Let's answer it. What is the duty of the Russian Marxists? Is to fight against their own ruling class. Fight against and expose Putin as a reactionary counter-revolutionary, which he is. What's the duty of the Ukrainian Marxists? It's to fight against Ukrainian nationalism, against the government of Kiev, against the so-called war on terror. And what's the duty of the IMT? And by the way, here is an absolute scandal of the first proportion. Some so-called Trotskyist sects but actually defend the Kiev government against the so-called separatists, against Russian imperialism, you see? It is an absolute disgrace that anyone, anyone can support the Kiev government in any sense, shape or form. These people are on, are on the wrong side of the barricades. They're in the camp of imperialism. They apologize for imperialism. And of fascism, let's be blunt about it. Our duty as an international is to combat the main enemy, which is U.S. imperialism and its puppet government in Kiev, and to denounce the, propag the disgrace disgraceful propaganda of our own bourgeoisie, which are telling lies and uh, defending imperialism. And we must unmask them. And of course, we're very delighted that Comrade Dimitri is here from uh, Ukraine. And I will uh, stand here and I'll give my pledge now. On behalf of every section of the IMT, our main duty is to defend the comrades of the left wing and the work workers and communists of the Ukraine. Against this fascist terror. And Comrade Dimitri, you can, you can count on our absolute support.
We will discuss this question further because it must also serve to raise the level that are important theoretical questions involved in this issue. Uh, but of course, it does show a change in world relations. If it, if it wasn't so serious, if it wasn't so tragic, it would even be, it would even be comical. You know. Merkel started this nonsense, following her ambitions, the ambitions of German imperialism, which always wanted to take over the Ukraine. But uh, now she's terrified of, of the consequences. It can have very serious results for the whole of Europe. Especially if Putin sends in the army, which he doesn't want to do because it's a hot potato and it costs a lot of money. However, the situation in Ukraine is out of control. The Ukrainian forces have taken uh, Slavyansk and uh, they found that quite difficult. Yes, but now they've got the task of taking Donetsk. It's a big city of one and, a, one and three quarter millions, I think. And if they do that, they enter Donetsk, then there can be a, a, a bloodbath. The big losses on both sides. And even if they take Donetsk, it won't be the end of the story. You'll have a period of partisan warfare, terrorism. It can last for years. And in the meantime, if there's a massacre in Donetsk, which is possible, because the, these people are mad dogs, mad dogs, then uh, Putin has, has played this card, so the, played the Ukrainian card up so much, And the, and the Russian, but, but we, by the way, we must distinguish comrades. We must distinguish. I say this to the Russian comrades in particular. We must denounce Putin and the oligarchy. We're not interested in the people of the Ukraine. But that's one thing. But many Russian workers, ordinary Russian workers, are profoundly moved by the problems of, of their brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. And that's a different thing altogether. You know, the, Lenin made that point. That the, uh, he made a point with the honest nationalism of the Russian workers, the Russian people. We must try to explain our uh, ideas to the, to the workers. One of the problems of the Russian left is that they're not able to reach the Russian. I've seen this. They're not able to have a common language with the workers. They don't understand the mentality of the workers. And therefore, we must, have a, a, must be careful how we express ourselves. But if there's a massacre in, uh, in Donetsk or anything like that, there'd be such, a, such an outrage among the masses in Russia that Putin may be obliged to send in the army. And Alexei pointed something out to me which I hadn't thought of. From a military point of view, it'd be far easier to take, for the Russian army to take Kiev, which is closer to the frontier. But than to move into the Donetsk region. So, is it possible the Russians will invade Ukraine? Yes, I think it is quite possible. If, he's push, if they push too far. Will it, is it a good thing? Do we support this? No, it would be a very bad thing and we cannot support it. Because of the effects on consciousness in the Ukraine, in Russia also, 
And of course, the consequences for the whole of Europe will be a disaster. It's 120. Uh, massive refugees. It would be like Palestine, put it that way. People would flee. And of course, that would have a destabilizing effect in Europe. It would have an effect on the European economy. I said there was a funny aspect. Well, uh, there's not much to laugh about, but I'll tell you what the funny aspect is. You know, Obama says, we must take action against Russia, we must take, well, we must go to sanctions, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. This is a disgrace. The West must so resolve. He said that a few months ago. And he showed resolve. He showed, res showed great resolve. How did he react to the Ukrainian crisis? A couple of months ago, three months ago. He sent 200 US Marines. Putin's got 40,000 troops on the frontier of, Paul, of, of Ukraine. He sends 200 U uh, American Marines to Lithuania. You know, the, uh, Putin must be trembling in his shoes. And then he says, Europe, Europe, Europe should take action. Why, why don't you move sanctions against Putin? As I said in an article the other day, you know, there was a, there was a, a record company called uh, His Master's Voice. And on the records they had a little la red label with a, a little dog sitting in front of a gramophone, an old-fashioned old gramophone, listening to his master's voice. That's a perfect description of the relations between American imperialism and British imperialism. His master's voice. So Obama makes a speech. And the little dog in London starts to bark. His master's voice. Cameron makes a, few, a, a fiery speech in the House of Commons. We're going to punish Russia. We're going to have sanctions. And what hypocrites these French are. He didn't mention the French, but he meant the French. Look, they're selling warships to Russia. You know, these warships can be used in, in, in the east of the Ukraine. Except that there's no sea in the east of the Ukraine. There's, still, there's, still. there's hypocrisy. The very next day, the French were very sensitive about the English criticizing them. Published on the front page of their paper. Monsieur Cameron, <laughs> who is the hypocrite? You know, all the Russian oligarchs are living in London, which is true. They're buying up all the property, paying millions of pounds, which is true. They're paying millions of pounds to the British tax uh, collector, which is true. Some of them even own English football, first division football clubs. Not that it made much difference to the World Cup, I hasten to add. You know, and, and the latest story was quite amusing. The latest story I re read in the newspaper when I was coming across. Cameron and his party, the Conservative Party, have received about a million pounds in direct donations from Russian oligarchs. 
And the da Daily Mirror said, Mr. Cameron, are you going to return this money? That would be a good way of hitting the Russians. Silence. And of course, uh, Frau Merkel, you know, she said, become very silent all of a sudden. Hollande is selling these, uh, at a great profit, is selling these ships to the Russians. Uh, and of course, there's a slight difficulty for Germany. It needs Russian gas. And Vladimir is sitting in the Kremlin with his hand on the tap. So silence. They haven't taken any serious measures against Putin. Nothing. Nothing. I don't think they will. They, they split. They divided. Southern Europe, Europe is against. Germany keeps its mouth shut. France keeps its mouth shut. And the little puppy dog in London keeps on barking all the time. And still takes millions of pounds off the Russian oligarchs. You know, and the Americans, the Americans are very anxious to fight to the last drop of somebody else's blood. <laughs> no, but this is a serious point. Because it, it does show an important change in world relations. In America, there's a lot of war weariness among the American people now. After the, uh, the defeat in, in Iraq, that's what it amounts to, the mess in, Af in Iraq, the mess in Afghanistan. The people are tired, and they can't afford it anyway. They couldn't intervene in Syria. They can't invade, they can't intervene militarily in the Ukraine. If Putin wants to take the Ukraine, you take it like that. The only thing that stops him is he doesn't want to take it because it will cost a lot of money. But in any case, you see here how world relations, not just from a, an economic point of view, World relations are a very, uh, at a very explosive stage. I haven't got time to deal with Gaza. Which is, and by the way, you see the, the hypocrisy of the imperialists. How many people were, have been killed in Gaza so far? I haven't read the paper. Must be a thousand at least. I can't. What is it, Dara? Over a thousand. Over a thousand men, women, and children are being slaughtered in Gaza. Mercilessly, hospitals are bombed. It's a t terrible state of affairs. And uh, the Americans do nothing. Where's the, where, where's the demand for sanctions against Israel? Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Israel is our friend. And because of the, the Arab Revolution, Israel is the only point of support of American, the only firm point of support for American imperialism in the Middle East. So they, they can't afford to go against uh, Israel. You contrast that to the noise they made about this uh, Malayan airliner. So of course, it was a terrible tragedy. But you see, they've got double standards always. There have been demonstrations about Gaza all over the world. <laughs> Pakistan Commerce did a marvelous job organizing demonstrations. But you see here how it's foreign affairs, affairs happening in different countries that can affect the consciousness of people. Not only economics. Sometimes I get the impression some of our comments are not Marxist, but economic determinists, which has nothing to do with Marxism. 
But the rest of my time, which is limited, I must deal with the main issue, which is the, the question of class consciousness. You know, now, of course, uh, the crisis has gone on, what, for six years now. And what effect has it had on the consciousness of the, of, of the workers? Well, first of all, there have been <laughs> mass movements on a, on a colossal scale. Revolutionary movements in one country after another. This time last year, when I was speaking, I was speaking here, we had the explosive developments in Egypt, where 17 million people took to the streets. Comrades, this is, this is unprecedented in history. It's unprecedented. It's far bigger than anything that occurred in Russia in 1917. And the Egyptian masses uh, overthrew the Morsi government like a man brushing a mosquito off his arm. If that was not a revolutionary movement, I don't know what is. You had the explosions in Turkey, which uh, came like, like, like a, a bolt from the blue. You had the insurrection, insurrectionary movements in Brazil. Although Brazil and Turkey were supposed to were economic success stories. But the, que the question that must be asked, you're bound to ask it, so I will ask it for you. I'll save you the trouble. You had these movements. In Greece, you've had how many general strikes? 30, I can't remember. Trianda, that's it. The Femami. Trianda. Right, okay. 30 general strikes in Greece. And the question we have to ask is this. What more can you ask of the working class? What do you expect of them? More than what they did in the examples that I've just given. And yet, the question is 12 months later, what happened in Egypt? That's a question we should discuss. Because there is, there, there is a revolution in Egypt, which has been going on for some years. When, when did it start, John? I can't remember. 2011, yes. We wrote a lot about that at the time. Yeah, but what's happened? What's happened to the Egyptian revolution? Because now in Egypt, what we see is not revolution, but counter-revolution. How do you explain this? Is there something wrong with the working class? Of course, the reformists and the Stalinists always blamed the workers. It is one of the, it's the psychological basis of Stalinism, actually. It's a complete lack of confidence of the working class. We, on the contrary, we, on the contrary, have absolute confidence in the working class and absolute confidence in the masses. Yes, but you see, revolutions, as you, as you ought to know, do not move in a straight line. It's not a triumphal march from one success to another. And it cannot be so. It cannot be so. If you take even 1917, the revolution took place over nine months. It wasn't all over in an instant. Because a revolution is a learning process. The masses cannot learn from books. Not, be, not because they're stupid, they're not stupid. Because of the conditions of life. 
They can only learn from one thing. They learn from experience, from direct participation in mass action. And that's not a simple question. There can be many defeats. You take 1917, nine months in which you had periods of great advance, like, like the February Revolution, but you had periods of defeat and, and, and tiredness and reaction from July to August, where there was a rise of Bonapartist tendencies. I'll deal with that in a moment. Lenin had to flee to Finland. Yeah, I actually said to Zinovia, I think, I think we're going to be murdered. If, if I'm killed, please make sure that the text of uh, State and Revolution is published, he said. I thought you were going to fill my glass, you're failing in your task. And then there was another uh, uh, upsurge. From September, October, and up to the, the, rest of the, up to the 7th of November. Now, let's be clear about this. Because I think some communists have sometimes got a simplistic attitude towards revolution. The fact that there's a revolutionary movement of the masses, in and of itself, does not guarantee success. Revolutions can be defeated. And many more revolutions have been defeated than have succeeded. Let us put it differently. In 1917, if it had not been for the presence of the Bolshevik party, no, I'll rectify that statement. If it had not been for the presence of the Bolshevik party under the leadership of Lenin and Trotsky, What you'd have had in Russia was not a victorious socialist revolution, but Russian fascism and the Kornilov or one of the other gangsters. Okay. What we, uh, therefore, what we must propose is this. The Spanish revolution is, is, is an even more interesting example. It took place over a period of seven years, approximately. Again, periods of great uh, upsurge, like, like the fall of the monarchy, proclamation of the republic. But then you had the defeat of the Asturian Commune, and the two black years, two years of reaction, which again led to another upsurge which ended in the Civil War. And the last opportunity to succeed was in May 1937 in Barcelona. What's the difference between Spain and Russia? Only one thing. The presence of the subjective factor. You know, and without that, it's very difficult that the workers can succeed. Maybe not impossible. I mean, they succeeded in the Paris Commune and there was no party. <laughs> yes, but for that very reason, the, 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 the Commune was defeated because they made mistakes. In the case of Egypt, it's enough to make you weep. You know, all the conditions were there 12 months ago. What was the position 12 months ago? Power was in the streets, waiting for someone to pick it up. In fact, power was in the hands of the Egyptian masses. They had the power, but they didn't know they had the power. They didn't take decisive measures to take the power. And therefore, in a situation of deadlock between the classes, then you get the rise of Bonapartist tendencies. The, the state tends to rise above society in the form of the army. Now this gangster Sisi is in power. 
It's a counter-revolutionary situation. By the way, by the way, both Kerensky and Kornilov were both Bonapartists of different sorts. Hell, I need a bit more time. Yes, but is that is it finished? It's not finished. The, what do the Egyptian masses want? The Russian masses want, wanted peace, bread, and land, which Kerensky couldn't give them. The Egyptian masses want jobs, bread, and houses. Which Sisi can't give them. And what, what he's given them instead is uh, big increases in the cost of fuel, electricity. When people are still on the bread line. And there's an explosive move now in Egypt, which is reflected. I would have done have time to quote from this, but it's a very interesting article Rob gave me. Perhaps you'd like to quote. Are you going to, are you going to come in on this? Not on this. Oh, no. Well, the chairman, will, the chairman will forgive me. He's talking to a driver here, a bus driver, I think. He's, the article is talking to a bus driver. And he says, we have had enough. We've had enough, he shouted. Enough of the expensive life and enough of this exploitation. We blame the man in charge and Ahmed Al, and, and Ahmed Al Said. Before this increase, I thought that he would sort out the country. and bring down pr prices. And he said it was accompanied by a string of obscenities, which is not printed. So in other words, this is not a stable government in Egypt, not at all. And my advice to this uh, meeting, in relation to Egypt, watch this space. There will be new explosions. And in the course of this, the masses will be learning, the advance guard will be learning. But we have to reach them, which we're trying to do, although we've got very small forces. Now, I, w I would have spoken a lot on, on more on Europe. The European elections just took place. And predictably, the press was saying, oh, look, there's a big swing to the right. And so Hugh Kip in Britain. Uh, uh, Le Pen in France. Le Front National. This is entirely false. Entirely false. You can't speak about a turn to the right in Greece. In Greece, Syriza won the election. In Italy, for what it's worth, the, the, the Democratic Party won the elections. That's supposed to be left. Not in practice. And above all, in Spain, you have the phenomenon of Podemos, which is worth discussing at length. It's a political earthquake. And it shows there is a change. What sort of a change? You see, I, we wrote in the perspective document, I'm quoting from memory, along the following lines. The traditional mass organizations everywhere have been trans created by the workers to change society, have become transformed into monstrous obstacles in the road of the working class. Hard words. Now look, at the, look at the position in France. Uh, two years ago, I think it was, there was a massive swing to the left in France. Massive. In the elections. 
The Socialist Party gained a huge majority. And Melanchon, the, the Front de Gauche, the left front, was, had mass meetings in Marseille and other cities in which he talked in vague terms about revolution, which is what the people want to hear and what they are not hearing. And what they are not hearing. And that's the problem. The central contradiction is this. Beneath the surface, there is a, a, a boiling mood of anger, frustration, above all frustration, I would say. But it's not being articulated by anybody, by anybody on the left, anyway. Nobody. Nobody's. And therefore, there's this mood of frustration builds up. Directed against what? Directed against the old order. Bankers are universally hated. In the past, they were respected. Now, I, I believe they're slightly less popular than pedophiles and serial killers. Uh, politicians, scandal after scandal, corruption after corruption, it stinks. Not just the right, but the left also, the so-called left also. It stinks. They, they offer nothing. The church, in Ireland, for example, the church was, uh, was uh, virtually a dictatorship of the church. Now, it's, it's not, just a, not just a question of the scandal of, of, of pedophile priests and the cover-ups, which is monstrous. But they just dug up, I don't know, I think we, hundreds and hundreds of bodies of little children in a convent in Ireland. Children of unmarried mothers whose mothers were forced to give these children to the church. Their bodies are being dug up. They're investigating the cause of death. But there's no doubt that it was as a result of starvation. Ill treatment, torture. And medical experiments, like Hitler's concentration camps. Oh, yes. There are survivors who say when they were children, they were, doctors came and injected them with things they didn't know what they were. Medical experiments. That's the Holy Roman Apostolic Catholic Church for you. And the, the Protestants are no different, by the way, I hasten to add. Protestants are no different. The priests, the, the church is unpopular. Politicians are unpopular. The police is unpopular. The judges are unpopular. The press is unpopular. There's a hatred uh, and a distrust towards the establishment in general. Which, if the labor leaders were worth anything, they'd put themselves at the head of this discontent and give it a, a, a conscious expression. But no, 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 no. They, they don't do this because they are part of the establishment. It's, uh, it's the, the role of, uh, let's remind ourselves, it's the role of the social democracy. to betray the working class when they come to power, spread demoralization, and prepare the way for the victory of the right. That's what happened in France. Along the, under the pressure of Mélenchon, he made some left speeches.
He promised he wouldn't carry out a policy of austerity. That's precisely what he's doing. And therefore there's a wave of revulsion among people. We're looking for an alternative. Now, if the Communist Party of France and, and the, uh, Mélenchon had maintained the left front in opposite, clear opposition, they'd be rising like that. But, but they didn't do that. The so-called communist leaders in France, greedy for office, in the municipal elections, formed a, a, a block, an electoral block with the Socialist Party. At a time when the Socialist Party's support was collapsing. Hollande is the most unpopular president of France in the history of the Fifth Republic. And that is saying something. And in general, there is a mood of uh, alienation from uh, the traditional left parties. Should that surprise us? I'm surprised that anyone should be surprised. You know, but in, Fra but in, but in, in Spain you have very important development. Six months ago, Podemos did not exist. I actually met the leader of uh, uh, Podemos, Pablo Iglesias, uh, 18 months ago in Caracas. He was unknown at the time. I didn't know him, he knew me. He approached me for an interview, which I gave and so on. But here, here's a movement organized by a group of radicalized uh, intellectuals, I suppose. that didn't exist, I had no money, no apparatus, no nothing. They got 8% of the vote in the European elections and five members of parliament. The uh, other parties were stunned, absolutely stunned. You see, the 8% doesn't tell you the, true sto the full story. All over Spain, <laughs> Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people are, are flocking to the meetings of Podemos. Not just students and middle class people. Workers, trade unionists, socialists, communists. Who are looking for something. I was approached uh, a few months ago, by a, we had a, an email from a young worker, not a student, a young worker in the Citroën factory in, the, in Vigo, in, in Galicia. He said, well, I've read your articles, I like what you have to say, and I'd like more contact. I answered, I said, well, can you say a little bit about yourself? Who are you? Where do you work? And so on. He said, I work in the Citroën car factory. I consider myself a Marxist. I want to organize, but I'm, but I'm surrounded by idiots. He said. And, and we don't have a real trade union. It's a, it's a yellow trade union, it's a boss's union. I wrote back and said, well, I don't think your work makes our idiots. You must be patient. They will learn by experience and so on. And we should discuss, should discuss with the comrades in, in, of, of uh, Lucha de Classes about organizing in the IMT. The day after the European elections, the same young worker wrote to me. He said, they're in the factory. Everyone is talking about Podemos. Everybody. In other words, it's had a big effect. 
Now, of course, we are not impressionists. We understand perfectly the limitations of Podemos. It's, uh, in, in its leadership, at least, it's a petty bourgeois movement. Yeah, but, but they have some good ideas. For example, the state tried the state tried to sabotage them by, by refusing to give them money. They're supposed to get money from the state. So the, how did they respond? The five euro deputies have agreed to take a worker's wage, which they publicized. They publicized. And the rest of the money will be given either to, to mass movements, strikes, and so on, or to, the, to Podemos. We, Anna and I had a discussion with a, a man who was uh, prominent in that movement, shall we say, active in the movement. He's a university lecturer in Madrid, very friendly towards us. His son is one of the, one of the organizers of Podemos, one of the national organizers. And he was explaining that when they were going to go to Brussels, they were given the offer of first-class rail tickets. They said, we refuse to accept this. It's against our principles to travel first class. And they traveled by, they said, well, that's all we, that's all we can offer you. That's the deal. So I think they went by Ryanair, some cheap uh, means. And this kind of thing has a big effect, big effect. There is, there was, uh, there was a, a, a public opinion poll conducted by the El País newspaper. I think Jordi can give the actual figures. I don't have them to hand. But it, it says. Possible votes in the next election, what party would you possibly vote for? Possibly, no, possibly. And, and Podemos came top, I think. And what did they get? Jordi, what was the figure? Jordi's got the, Jordi's always got the figures. Eh? Anyway, Podemos came top. With 21%. And who came second? Give the figures, Jordi. He's, he's lost. He's lost. For, for once, Jordi Martorell is lost. I'm astonished. I'm astonished. But, yeah, possible. Po poss which party would you possibly vote for? 27% for Podemos. 21 for the United Left. And the others? Socialist Party, 17 yeah. I don't know what that is even, 16. And the last one? Pardon? And the popular party, that's the right-wing party, 12%. In other words, the right-wing popular party is shattered. Its support is shattered. But the socialist party doesn't pick up the opposition. On the contrary. Because people remember. People remember what they did when they were in power. And therefore the left parties, I mean, 27% and 21, was it, Jody? That's 48% for the left, for the, for the United Left and the Podemos. It's a bit more complicated as Jody, but it doesn't matter. It's clear that there's a beast. Now look, we don't have any illusions about this. Podemos has ar 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 arisen very quickly. It might disappear just as quickly. There are contradictions within it that we know. But that is not the point. The point is, is what? Let's, 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 let's examine this. Let, let, come on, let's try to, to, to look at this. With a clear head, without prejudices. Okay? Because very often I think we're a bit formalistic and a bit rigid in the way we propose things. What do these things express? What did the rise of Syriza express in, in Greece? For example, 
it expresses the fact that, uh, and even, even in a sense, the votes for Le Pen, the votes for UKIP, and it shows what? This same instability which I mentioned earlier finds its expression inevitably on, on the electoral field in violent swings to the left and to the right. And to the right. I mean, the idea that it's to the left wing, always moving to the left, that's a very foolish conception. Which I hope nobody has that conception. The masses are desperately trying to find a way out of this crisis. And they put one, one after another, they put political parties to the test. And you, in, invariably, they find that they, they're not satisfied. They look for something else. Okay? And therefore, that's, that, that's the position. Somebody said to me, an experienced comrade on the IEC, very good comrade, said to me, I was very surprised by, by Podemos. I, I answered, I said, look, was I surprised? No, I was not surprised in the slightest degree. Did I expect it? No, I did not. Nobody expected this. Was I surprised by it when I saw it? No, because it flows precisely from our analysis of the general situation. The crisis is having a profound effect. Don't doubt it, comrades. Don't doubt it. A profound effect on the psychology of the masses. In the future, for those comrades who get a little bit uh, itchy when, when, whenever one, one mentions the mass organization, some people get a twitch. You know, I hasten to add, do we intend to abandon our perspectives for the development of the mass organizations? For example, the British Labour Party? Not in the slightest degree. Our perspectives remain the same. We have to follow the situation closely and see how things are developing. But you know, tactics are very important and cannot be reduced to overall perspectives. That's a serious mistake, Connor. Very serious mistake. In war, the general's got an overall perspective, a, a battle plan. It's a, a, general, a general that entered a battle without a battle plan would be a very bad general. But once you enter the battle, your tactics are not determined by a preconceived plan. But, but by concrete circumstances. And therefore, our tactics at this moment in time must, on pain of extinction, must be extremely flexible. And what we have to do is not walk around with our nose in, with our nose in a perspectives document, but to follow closely the actual process of events themselves. and adapt our tactics accordingly. Trotsky said, perspectives is a science, but tactics is an art. And you will not learn this art from it. There's no cookbook that you can learn this art from. And yesterday's slogans will not help us. to respond to the demands of the present situation. In order to build the organization, and that's what it's about, by the way, to build the organization. What is necessary is to keep your eyes and ears open, examine the situation as it develops in all aspects, 
Identify any possibility and exhaust it to the full. I hasten to add, without abandoning our general perspectives which haven't changed, they're the same. They're the same. So that, to, to, to finish, because I've covered a lot of ground, I covered a lot of ground, and yet I've covered a very little ground. The situation is extremely complicated. There are all kinds of cross currents, which we have to explain and understand. But at all times, to keep our finger on the pulse of the mass movement, which will not necessarily follow a preconceived course. And above all, and I finish on it, above all, above all, build the subjective factor. Build the factor that is necessary. Build the factor which is necessary to, uh, to guarantee the future success of the working class. And that means, we've said it before, we've said it before, we'll say it again, and we'll keep on saying it until it's carried out by all sections. And it's nothing new, by the way. Lenin and Trotsky said the same thing a thousand times. Comrades, turn to the youth. Turn to the new, fresh elements who are there, who are looking for, for, for this tendency. Comrades, it's not difficult. There are many people that are looking for these ideas. And we must not make it difficult for them to join this organization. We must make it easy to join the organization. And therefore, comrades, this Congress, on the 150th anniversary of the First International, must be a, a springboard, a point of departure, to translate these general uh, perspectives into concrete action which will build the forces of revolutionary Marxism and therefore guarantee that the objectively favorable situation moves in the direction of the conquest of power by the working class as the only solution to the crisis of humanity.